and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we'll be talking about Wilson's disease. So let's get started. So what is Wilson's disease? Wilson's disease is a rare autosomal recessive inherited disorder of copper metabolism. It is characterized by the excessive accumulation of copper in the body and the deposition of copper in various organs which include the liver, the brain, and other tissues which may include the eyes, heart, kidneys, and the hormonal glands. This condition is due to a mutation in the ATP7B gene. So from this definition of Wilson's disease, we get that the disease is an autosomal recessive inherited disorder, which means that there's some sort of a genetic predisposition of the disease. And we also get that the disease manifests as this accumulation of copper in the body. And this copper deposition usually occurs in some specific organs, which include the liver, the brain, and the eyes, heart, and kidneys. And from this definition, we also get that the disease is due to a mutation in the ATP7B gene. So now that we know what Wilson's disease is, let's take a closer look at the genetics involved in the disorder. So the genetic background. Wilson's disease is an autosomal recessive disease. It occurs equally in men and women, and most people are diagnosed between the ages of 5 and 35. In order to inherit Wilton's disease, both parents must carry at least one genetic mutation, meaning an abnormal alteration in the gene, that will be passed on to the affected child. Of the 23 different human chromosomes, the gene responsible for Wilson's disease is located on chromosome number 13. The gene is called ATP7B, and contains the genetic information necessary to make a copper transport protein that plays a key role in incorporating copper into cellular plasmin and moving excess copper out of the liver. Mutations in this gene lead to an abnormal copper transportation, causing the movement of copper to become completely ineffective. So to simplify this slide, Wilson's disease is an autosomal recessive disease, meaning that someone can be a carrier but not be affected with the disease. So therefore the affected individual needs two broken genes or two abnormal mutated genes. We also learn from this slide that the chromosome affected in Wilson's disease is chromosome number 13 and the specific area is actually called 13Q14, Q21. And this site or this gene is called the ATP7B gene. So if you look at this image down here on my left, you see that to, in order to have Wilson's disease, which is an affected or a TT, which means two broken genes or two mutated genes, the child must inherit one broken gene from their mother and one from their father. But these are actually healthy carriers. So the mother is healthy, meaning without Wilson's disease, and so is the father. And they can give birth to a child who is healthy without any abnormal genes, a child who is a carrier, another child who is a carrier, and finally, a child who can be affected. And this is because Wilson's disease is autosomal recessive, meaning that even if you have a broken gene, it doesn't mean that you will have the disease. It just means that you are a carrier, unless you have two abnormal ATP7 genes, in which case you will develop the disease. Pathophysiology. Copper taken in from the diet is absorbed by the small intestine. From here it is bound to a protein that circulates in your blood and this protein is called albumin and is transported to your liver to be stored. Normally, any copper your body doesn't use is carried away by the bile, which is a fluid produced by the liver to aid in digestion and is excreted from the body. Biliary excretion is the only means of removing copper. When this pathway is not working properly, an accumulation, meaning a buildup of copper, in the body will follow. This accumulation of copper will lead to serious and possibly irreversible damage to your liver if not treated. When the copper storage capacity of your liver cells, which are the hepatocytes, is exhausted, the copper spills into the bloodstream and deposits in other parts of your body, primarily in the sites of the brain, the eyes, the kidneys and the joints. The presence of copper in these organs cause oxidative stress resulting in cell destruction. The liver is the first organ to be affected by copper accumulation and for around half the people who have Wilson's disease, 
it is the only affected organ. So if you remember in the slide before, we said that the ATP7B gene contains genetic information necessary to make a copper transport protein that plays a key role in incorporating copper into the cellular plasmid and moving excess copper out of the liver. So if we come back to this picture, so basically, as we said, copper is taken in through our diet, undergoes some sort of a digestive process in the stomach and is absorbed from the small intestine. When it is absorbed, it enters the liver. And because patients who have Wilson's disease don't have this copper transporting protein that helps them incorporate copper into the cereloplasmin, the consequence of this will be an excessive accumulation of copper within the liver. And when these copper deposits start to accumulate in the liver, they cause oxidative stress on the liver, which means local inflammation of the liver. And when the liver becomes inflamed, it starts to have some sort of a liver failure because now it cannot undergo its daily tasks because it's under a lot of stress. And when this copper accumulation becomes too much for the liver, it will actually spill out into the bloodstream and the copper will be deposited in other areas of the body, including the brain, the cornea of the eye, the kidneys and the joints, etc. So if you look at this little box up here, we see that the biliary excretion of copper elimination is decreased. We also see that the copper incorporation in the cellular plasma will be decreased and there will be an excess, which means very high levels of free copper in the body. And this free copper will go in and deposit into these various organs, causing damage and oxidative stress in these areas. So now that we understand the pathophysiology of the disease, let's look at the specific manifestations of the disease. Hepatic manifestations. So hepatic dysfunction is the presenting feature in more than half of the patients with Wilson's disease. And Wilson's disease can manifest as acute hepatitis, chronic active hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, which is the most common initial presentation, or fulminant hepatic failure. And signs of liver damage can include the following. Fatigue, lack of appetite, abdominal pain, ascites and prominent esophageal viruses, spider navy, hepatic encephalopathy, pulmonary erythema, digital clubbing, hematemesis, which means the vomiting of fresh blood, and jaundice, which is the yellowing of the sclera and the skin. And you can see from these pictures on my left, you see a normal liver above, and then you see a diseased liver that has actually become fibrotic due to that copper buildup. So again, those manifestations, they will have prolonged periods of fatigue and itching sensation, and this is due to that bilirubin deposits into the skin. There can be swelling of the lower legs, the jaundice, which is the yellowing of the skin and the eyes, getting bruised easily because the liver actually makes specific clotting factors, and if these clotting factors are not produced, we can bruise easily and bleed easily. There will be fluid buildup, and that is because the liver actually makes proteins. And if we have some sort of hypoproteinemia, which is a low level of protein in the body, we can have fluid buildup in the body. There can also be hepatic encephalopathy, internal bleeding, unconsciousness, loss of appetite, and a high blood pressure. So now let's talk about the neuropsychiatric symptoms, and this is due to the copper deposition into the brain. So about half of the people with Wilson's disease have neurological or psychiatric symptoms. Most patients initially experience mild cognitive deterioration and clumsiness, as well as changes in behavior, including impulsiveness, disinhibition, and showing of self-injurious behavior. Later manifestations can include dystonia, spasticity, grand mal seizures, rigidity, and flexion contractures. Now let's talk about some other organ systems that can be involved. So the eyes play a prominent feature because they have the specific Kaiser Flesher rings or the KF rings and this is a pathognomic sign that may be visible in the cornea of the eyes either directly or on a slit lamp examination as deposits of copper in a ring around the cornea. They are due to the copper deposition in Decimet's membrane. So if you look at this picture, you see this ring around the cornea, and this is actually a ring of copper, and is one of the key features that can be seen in a Wilson's disease. 
The kidneys can also be affected and here we can have renal tubular acidosis type 2. This is a disorder of bicarbonate handling by the proximal tubules leading to nephrocalcinosis which means calcium accumulation in the kidneys and a weakening of the bones due to calcium and phosphate loss. And this essentially leads to urolithiasis and hematuria. So urolithiasis meaning kidney stones that occur in the kidneys and hematuria which means blood in the urine. The heart can also be involved in Wilson's disease and the prominent feature here being cardiomyopathy which means a weakness of the heart muscle and this is rare but is a recognized problem in Wilson's disease and it may lead to heart failure and a fluid accumulation due to a decreased pump function and cardiac arrhythmias which means episodes of irregular and or abnormally fast or slow heartbeats. We can also have the hormone systems that are affected. Patients with Wilson's disease can experience hypoparathyroidism and this is a failure of the parathyroid glands leading to low calcium levels, infertility and habitual abortions. They may also experience skeletal abnormalities such as osteoporosis, osteomalacia, rickets and spontaneous fractures as well as polyarthritis. And finally, they can have skin pigmentation problems and this is usually seen as a bluish discoloration at the base of the fingernails and you can see it quite clearly in this picture here and these are called the azure lenulae. So how can one diagnose say Wilson's disease? So the serum seroloplasmin levels in Wilson's disease are usually less than 20 milligrams per deciliter and the reference range for this level is actually 20 to 40 milligrams per deciliter and this occurs in about 90 percent of patients. We can also measure the urinary copper excretion rate which is usually greater than 100 micrograms per day and the reference range is actually less than 40 micrograms a day. So in patients with Kaiser Flesher rings, a serum seroloplasmin level of less than 0 mg per deciliter and a 24-hour urine copper excretion of more than 40 micrograms per day can establish the diagnosis of a Wilson's disease. We can also measure the hepatic copper concentration on a liver biopsy and a specimen more than 250 micrograms per gram of dried weight even in asymptomatic patients can put a diagnosis of Wilson's disease. The normal result is actually 15 to 55 micrograms per gram and this effectively excludes the diagnosis of an untreated Wilson's disease but elevation may be found in other chronic hepatic disorders. We can also use radio labeled copper testing and this directly assays the hepatic copper metabolism we can also do genetic testing for the mutation analysis of the ATP7B gene. Brain imaging can be helpful and can show us characteristic findings. An MRI appears to be more sensitive than a CT in detecting early lesions, so early brain lesions can be seen. Abdominal imaging such as a CT or an ultrasound can be very helpful to find signs of liver damage. Resting ECG abnormality, including left ventricular or biventricular hypertrophy, early repolarization, ST segment depression, T wave inversion, and various arrhythmias can also be helpful. Because remember, again, we said that the heart is also affected in patients with Wilson's disease. And finally, we can also use electron microscopy to detect copper containing hepatocytic lysozymes that can be helpful in the diagnosis of early stage Wilson's disease in addition to quantification of the hepatic copper by atomic absorption spectrophotometry. And now, let's talk about the treatment of Wilson's disease. So the first thing we recommend is a diet low in copper containing foods and it is important to instruct the patient to avoid mushrooms, nuts, chocolates and dried fruit, liver, sesame seeds and sesame oil as well as shellfish because they are high in copper. We can also do medical treatment and part of these drugs is penicillamine and this is the first treatment used and this drug binds copper and acts as a chelation agent and leads to the excretion of copper in the urine. So it actually chelates the copper meaning it binds all the copper in the body and then it allows for the excretion via the urine. Another drug that is commonly used is triantine and this works much like penicillamine but tends to cause fewer side effects. 
And we can also use zinc acetate and this medication prevents the body from absorbing the copper from the food the patient eats. In some patients, a liver transplantation may be used and this is used mainly in people with fulminant liver failure who are failing to respond to medical treatment or in those with advanced chronic liver disease. Anticholinergics, antiepileptics and neuroleptics can be used to treat the neuropsychiatric symptoms. And I just put in this quick slide and it talks about Samuel Alexander Kinnear Wilson and he was an American-born British neurologist and his research of hepatolenticular degeneration led to the disease to be named after him as Wilson's disease. And that brings us to the end of this video on Wilson's disease. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe and share. And if you'd like to download a copy of the presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.